so yeah, I'm just going to wrap a few things up uh, since it's well, next to last day of the conference. Everybody is tired, uh, so I'm not going to do anything too complicated. Um, so, so one thing I, I promised uh, to do at some point is describe uh, a natural system of maps from the universal curve of Riemann disks of kind of punctured Riemann disks to the, the standard topological n simplices. So it's the n simplices. So, so this was somehow uh, necessary for the construction that I was that uh, I was outlining in, in my first lecture, and I think it's kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. Well, so first of all, uh, right. So, so, so I, I called I called these spaces before S D. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, this sort of fits into the discussion discussion of infinity structures, kind of stash of stash of type infinity structures. that uh, Muhammad talked about, and uh, also Somnath. Uh, and the other reason, and so I, I think this will, will, will give perhaps uh, some more insight into that. And the other reason, well, it's just somewhat mysterious because, well, uh, so the, the n simplices, so the n simplices, so delta n's, so they are building blocks for singular homology. And the fact that there are these, the, there are these maps, uh, these natural maps, uh, well, it's sort of curious. I mean, one must lead to ask, uh, for example, so, so one question is, is there, some, is there some homology theory that can be built? From these universal curves. But at the moment, I have no idea, and maybe it may be sort of the wrong question. But anyway, it's curious. And so, for example, if I, if I replace this by, if I take a cube instead, then there is absolutely not, nothing natural that that I can see. Uh, no, no natural maps of this kind that I can see. Okay, so uh, so let's review. So, uh, so first of all. Uh, yeah, so, so, well, yeah, so I'm going to say, actually, right now. So I'm going to, going to say what SD is. So, so RD is, uh, so, so Riemann disks. With 
d plus 1 punctures on the boundary. Uh, so uh, moduli space compactified. So compactified moduli space. Uh, oops, wrong, wrong arrow. Uh, And so, so then you have the kind of the universal curve, Rd. Uh, so we can think of this as follows. We can we can look at uh, we can look at Rd and then add a a mark point. So anywhere on the curve, anywhere on the surface except uh, except the punctures. So put one here. So it's an extra mark point. And then, uh, so naturally compactify that. And then there's a map here, kind of just forget the mark point. Forget the mark point. And so, this, so basically, this R R D one is modeling is modeling this S D. So this is the so-called universal curve. And so this is, so here you have, so one is for extra mark point. On the surface. Okay. So Okay, so now let me Okay, so let me uh, um define following category. This is a category with objects vertices of Delta N and uh, morphisms just uh, I, I can use them as edges. So edges. Morphisms edges. So since since there's a unique since, since there's a unique edge between any two vertices. Uh, the the composition maps are uh, completely determined. So composition maps are determined. Are uniquely determined. So, for example, this edge composed with this edge. It's just this edge, right? So this is a morphism. This is a morphism. This is M one times M two. Okay. So um, and I'm going to write. M one. Ms uh, for a chain of composable morphisms. In phi delta n. So, so this means that the source, so the target of mi is source of m i plus 1. Uh, 
uh, yeah, will they direct it? Yeah. So, directed edges, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what we want is, what we're going to do is we're going to construct some maps which are uh, so which are labeled by uh, by a chain of composable morphisms by a composable chain and n and this is going to go from uh, I think I also need d here d n and this goes from S D to delta N. So, uh, so we're almost that. So, except that, right? So, so except from, if you recall from from last from the first lecture, I decorated by a circle. So the circle basically means that. So in your so for your nodal. For your nodal curves, you you take out take out the punctures, uh, the take out the nodes, take out the nodes. So in principle, like in this example, uh, this will disconnect the surface, but uh, you want to remember how to glue it back together. So it's part of the structure. So you disconnect, but it's kind of just a formal disconnection because you want to remember how to glue it back together. And so this is just, this is just in order to, to make sense uh, of what a map actually means. It's supposed to be a continuous map. Continuous. So, so in particular, these maps should satisfy the following. So the first property is that uh, so if I have my surface so this is inside uh, so this is a fiber so this is, this is fiber um, over R so SR fiber over R in Rd of Sd. So, uh, so I have kind of these n's that you label E0, E1, E2, and there are s of them. So this 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 one this last one is E s. So there. Are, it's going to be, uh, sorry, no, actually I have D here. Uh, so I want D. This last one is ED. Yeah, actually I think this, yes, this, this, this is the same. This is the same. Let me just check. So I like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. No, you have you have just as many as you have as you have um, inputs there. Okay. And so uh, so at the e i end. So in the strip coordinates. So I'm just going to call it EI again. So 0, 1 times um, to SR. So, so in this coordinates, so I have some EI end, and I have a strip coordinate chart. Uh, and 
Uh, so the map, the map U, U is just projection to zero one composed with MI. So here I'm 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 also thinking of F MIs are so I said edges, but you can also think of them as simplicial maps from zero one to your uh UN simplex. So that's what I mean here by composed with MI. <coughs> so so basically you you project so in this coordinates you project to, to zero one and then you apply MI. Okay. So then Then the next condition is that uh, uh, it's really far, but so you take the um, so u so so u is abbreviation for this u m one comma m d so u takes the edge of s r. Um, between uh, between the e i minus first and and the e i end Uh, to um, M to the source to S M S M I M I S M uh, second and no uh, S M I minus one. So this I'm calling this I'm calling E one. So so this is M one source. So okay, sorry. I have right, so I have right, so E zero, E one. Um yeah. Source, source, that's right, the source of MI. No. Uh, no, he, no, so, right, so, uh, so, um, MI are not necessarily distinct. So these, these MI are not distinct. Not only that, but they're allowed to be constant because otherwise you don't have a category. So maybe it's one thing I should say. But MI are not necessarily distinct. So they're just, a, just composable chain of morphisms in delta N. For example, I mean, so one degenerate example would be like you have delta zero. So then basically all your maps are constant. So all the ends are just sent to the to the constant edge. No, I mean these are these are allowed to be constant. So directed pass yeah, I mean it's a it's a category, so there's identity. So 
So I should say plus identity, so plus constant edges. Yeah. It's constant edges. Right, otherwise you don't have a category. I mean, so another way to think about this is that, uh, I mean, another way to think about pi delta n is, is, is that it's, a fund, it's the fundamental group void of delta n, where as objects you only take the vertices. So, uh, right. So, uh, okay, so, let, so let me just, yeah, so I, I have to finish this. So there's, so this is for, um, right. So this is for i between d and 1. Uh, and, and the component and the edge. So and u takes. Takes the edge. Um, between ED between uh, ED and E zero uh, to TMD. So So this edge, this edge is going to be taken to the target of the morphism MD. Okay, and then, right. So, so maybe, so maybe I should do an example uh, where, where, so for S2, which is, which is basically, you can just think of this as the surface. Like this, you have E0, E1, E2, and delta 2, which is just a two simplex. So I'm saying that, um, so the, the uh, yeah, so let's label this 0, 1, 2. And so, so this is the U, U, M0, 1, M, one two. So m zero one m one two means morphism from zero to one, morphism from one to two. So I have to take, so I have to take uh, squash this end onto the edge zero one. I have to squash. So maybe I use color, colors here. So this is going to go here. Uh, I have to squash E2 onto this edge. And then, well, uh, so then uh, this goes to zero vertex. Um, right. Uh, wait, actually, did I write this correctly? To source M I, yes, right. So it goes to the zero vertex. No. Source so M I here is yes, right, right, right. That's correct. So this goes to the zero, so this goes to the zero vertex. This goes to the uh, to the, the one vertex, 
and this goes to the two vertex. Goes to the two vertex. So, so I also drew the other picture before, but so uh, yeah. So this I've got to. So yeah, this this is collapsed onto the white edge. Oh, right. So this is just uh, what. So what. A, so, so at this point, you're just straight up generalizing that picture. There. Okay. So that's one part of the axioms. Sorry. Uh. Yes, yeah, so, so, so this is going to be defined for, right, so in principle this is defined for, for all D and all N. Yeah, so, so in this case I'm, I am uh, just looking at uh, D is equal to 2, uh, N is equal to 2, and this particular two morphisms. Ah, so if N is 3, well, uh, so d it depends what it depends on how which morphism you take. So if if I take the same morphisms m zero one m one two, then uh, then it's kind of very easy because we basically do the same thing. So this is unchanged. You just collapse onto that onto that edge. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I'll start here. So, um, so let me call T M one. MD and the collection of maps satisfying so th these two properties that I, that I mentioned. Um, right. Okay, so we have uh, a gluing map that I'm going to call STI. So it goes from RS1 times RS. Two times zero epsilon to plus it's two minus one. So this is like uh, what um, Somnath was talking about. Uh, well, maybe without the without the gluing parameter, but um, so it's just glue. Uh, with a certain um, small gluing parameter. Okay. Um, so, so then given an element Q in T uh, M1 prime M i minus one prime M one dot M S M i plus one prime. Come on, S two prime. Uh, so, given an element here and an element uh, 
u in t m1. So I think I, I had forgotten some label, but uh, I'll get back to it in a second. So m1 ms1 uh, n. So here I still have the, the label n. Um, so we get we get uh, an element um, um, well so we get so we get a map, so we get a map. Uh, u say star uh, u prime, and I'm gonna say sub subscript zero, which goes from s s one s two to delta n, where this s s one s two is the pullback. of uh, SD by STI. Okay. Right. So, I mean, so what is this? This basically just means you, you glue these two maps. Uh, S T uh, S T I. So S T I is the S T I is the gluing map. So so it's it's like the stash it's the stash of gluing map with a parameter telling you uh, um uh right so uh. Sorry, one second. Uh, so, uh, is, is the pullback, sorry, over, yeah, let me just, it's over R, so, so, so there's a zero here, right? So that's, so it's over RS1, RS2 times zero. That's that's what this the zero refers to. So uh, I mean, I mean, so you have you have two maps, you just pre-glue them, so to speak, and you, you're going to get a map like that. Um, What is D? A second. Uh, right. Uh, second. Uh, uh, one second. Let me think. Yes, I think so. So you're yeah, right, right. So, yeah, yeah. D is just s one plus s s one plus s two minus one. Indeed. Yeah. So so let me just. So just to draw this. So, so my, so my u, so my u is something like this. You have m1, m2, ms, and ms1, and then you have 
prime, which is maybe something like this, you know, like M1 prime and uh, right. So this is like M M2 M2 prime and then M prime S2. And uh, so, right, so, so, so then you basically just, you just pre-glue the maps to get, to get this map. Okay. So you can so you can extend this so we can extend this to map uh, u star u epsilon which goes from where where this uh, this s is now so it's the same thing but you you restrict the pullback over uh, so you restrict the pullback over RS1 times, times epsilon. And so basically the way that works is um, so in this picture, so now you so now you actually glued. So now you actually glued, so you have you have a picture like this. Um, but there is a so there is a region here that we call thin, and it has a holomorphic identification, holomorphically identified, identified uh, basically with the with the what do you call it? Uh, uh, oh, zero one times uh, minus tau. The rectangle. So, so basically, what we do to to make this extension is um, so in in this in this uh, region you. Um, so you, uh, so so in in this region, your 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 map is going to be uh, collapsing this to the interval zero one, and then following up with uh, m i. So so i is from here. So is that kind of clear? And then. Uh, uh, outside of this, outside of this thin region, you basically just keep, you, you basically keep u and u prime, kind of, without changing it. So, so I, I think I forgot u prime uh, on the second, right? U u prime. Okay, so. Um, okay, so so now, so let so let's just call C S uh, C S delta n the set of uh, uh, composable S chains of Morphisms 
pi delta n. So a system of maps, so a system of maps, definition, a system of, of maps, U is an element of, uh, so it's a product over N uh, product over S um, product over uh, this chains MI in CS and you do tau M1 MS N. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to say this is natural, right? And well, so the projection, so the projection of U to the component uh, N S M I is denoted U M one basically as before. Um, <clears throat> And then I'm going to say this is natural if the following axioms are satisfied. So, so the first is that if you do U M1 M S. R U so basically this um, this operation that I was describing before am I and you have M S one Right, oh, so uh, this means product in pi, this is product in pi delta n. In pi delta n. And then you have m prime i plus 1. M prime S2 N and epsilon. So so this is the this is the operation that I was describing here. Um, so so if this coincides with um, with the composition. S bar, S1, S2, epsilon. Then you do STI. Sorry, there's no there's no bar. Um, I'm, I'm already thinking of everything as being compactified. So S, S1 plus S2 minus 1, and then you do U, okay, M1 prime, uh, M prime, I minus 1, then the product, let's call this, uh, 
just call this k. K um, m prime i plus one dot 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 m prime s two n. So and this goes to delta n. Right, so, so, so this map also goes to delta n. So, okay. For, so this is for epsilon sufficiently small. Okay, so then the next property so the next property is uh, very natural, so if I have a face map. So the face map, face simplicial map, then um, F composed with U M1 uh, MS is the same thing as U F. M1. Uh, yeah. Fm, ms, and now this is n. Okay. And uh, next, uh, if I have a projection, so given projection, simplicial projection. Delta n. Um, so then I have I have an induced functor. And I require that PR compose with U M one. And S N plus K is U P R M one P R M S and and, and finally so this is not a this is not a true axiom because it follows from the axioms from the other axioms, but so let's say a meta axiom. But it's crucial. So so basically, uh, so in my space, so if I look at my R D, uh, I can look at the um, so there's going to be like a gluing neighborhood, some so some kind of epsilon gluing neighborhood. Neighborhood, and so I'm going to take a sphere there. Which uh, uh, is not touching the boundary. So this is a sphere 
s d minus 2. Oh, I have so many s's. But, uh, so it's a, it's a, well, anyway. So let, let's just, uh, uh, let's just bear with it. So this is a, a sphere I'm going to call, it's a sphere of dimension d minus 2. So this is rd. This is rd. Um, all right, so, so in the neighborhood and uh, not touching the boundary. So, uh, so then uh, what I can also do, so given, um, so, so for, for R in uh, Rd minus the boundary, the surface as R, so so I ha so I have my surface. Uh, I'm going to cut off the ends. So I have I have I have these ends, parametrized ends, by the strip charts. So this is S R. So the fiber over R. So I'll cut off the ends, and um, so we can uh, so and identify this uh, I want to say right. So yeah, so so I want to take yeah, a little bit too fast. Cut off the ends. So then I have S R minus ends, and then if I quotient out by the boundary, then I can identify this. with S2 in a homotopy natural in R homotopy natural in R way. So in a homotopy homotopy natural way. So basically, right, I mean, so, so once I cut off the ends, I can, I can parametrize all the surfaces here, basically. Well, so cut off the ends and quotient out by, by the ends, I basically get a family of spheres. And uh, so then my map, U, so you um, m1 md you m1 md and here I'm going to say d uh, induces induces a map Um, sorry, this is map U, which goes from, so, right, oh, I forgot, forgot another thing, so the, re the interior region here, I'm going to call, so this interior region I'm going to call R D minus 1 circ. Again, maybe not the best notation, but so it's just so it's just uh, this the solid sphere which is bounded by by the sphere. So so my maps are going to induce a map from R. Uh, is that right? Sorry. Oh, I think I have it actually wrong. So this should be d minus three. 
and then this is d minus 2. So this is supposed to be dimension. Yeah. So r0 d minus 2 modulo s0 uh, d minus 3 which is s d minus 2 and then times S2, so this S2 corresponds to this homotopy identification of the Riemann surface with S2. And this goes to delta D modular boundary, uh, boundary delta D, which is SD. So, um, and so the, the, this, this axiom tells you that, so, so this, this map I just have, I always have, and the axiom tells you that this is, a, this is degree one, this is degree one, degree one, if um, the minimal dimension of a subsimplex sub simplex of delta n delta d delta sorry d d d uh, containing the edges m1 to n d Is D. So, in other words, so just to give you an example, I mean, so these are all the so um, this is also the picture that I drew in the first in the first lecture, and I, I drew it together, drew again to get today. Basically, I'm always taking my, uh, my M1 to MD so that um, this is satisfied. I mean, this is both, mostly was just for, uh, for visualization purposes. <coughs> but um, anyway, so, so the point is that, right, so you have like 0, 1, 2, 3. So if I take my, if I take my edges, like this, yeah, so then the only subsimplex sub of delta 3, which contains these three edges, is delta 3 itself, right? On the other hand, if I take, if I take this, 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 then there will be this two-dimensional subsimplex, which will contain the three edges, and so, this will no longer be D. Okay. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean there, is a, there is a morphism from 0 to 2 and 2 to 0. So I, I'm not sure what you mean by directed. You can go both ways, yeah. Is that directed or, or not directed? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all persons are invertible. So like I said, it is just the fundamental groupoid of delta n, where you, where as objects you only take the vertices. Okay. Right, so this is uh, right. So this is so this took me actually much longer than I was than I was expecting. So just to state these axioms, um, I'm actually all sweating. <laughs> so okay, so so these are the axioms, and the theorem is that well, the theorem is much easier.
there is a natural system U. And it is unique up to homotopy through natural systems. So, so this, so this is what what uh, what is crucial in the construction of the Foucault category, the Hamiltonian vibration. So, I mean, so without this, you cannot even sort of start. Um, yeah, and, and so, so of course, originally, originally when I when I just started to think about this, well, how would you do this? I I basically started to construct some some maps by hand. Which seemed natural, but then uh, I realized that well, uh, I can only do this to a point in delta three and kind of in low dimensions, and it's not, it's not, not actually clear um, if, if, I, if I can always get such maps, and and even if I do have such maps, why would it be unique? Why why would any any choice? Why would you have a unique up to homotopy choice? So. So then, uh, well, so then, so it's a bit of a miracle that if you axiomatize the right way, you get a unique up to homotopy system like this. I mean, I don't fully understand what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, So, okay, okay, so let me, so let me leave this be now. Uh, there was another thing that I promised to discuss eventually, and, and it will be now. Um, so, so remember, uh, given a Hamiltonian vibration, um, uh, so we construct some functor from the category of simplices to the category of infinity categories. And I said that from this data, Uh, we can get um, a simplicial vibration over X. Over X or X or X bullet, uh, the singular simplicial set of X. So let me tell you how this works kind of directly. Um, so... So, like I said, uh, also in the first lecture, kind of the most kind of seemingly natural thing that one may want to do is take the limit over simp x of this functor, because then, well, so then you then you hope that this is uh, some infinity category, and we understand the infinity categories pretty well, so that so then you get some. Uh, some kind of an invariant uh, in principle, but it is not an invariant. So, so not invariant. That's basically because. So, I, I mean, there are many reasons for this. Some geometric, some algebraic. So, uh, one algebraic reason is that this category is horrible. So, so, so for example, if you uh, if you, when you first see the definition of a functor between infinity categories, well, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be, what is this? Uh, so the other problem is that uh, there is no good good way of gluing infinity categories, and so that stems from the fact that uh, 
this, this has no model structure. Has no model category structure. So we cannot glue, it's a, it's a nasty category. Um, so on the other hand, there is, a, there is this amazing functor called the nerve. So, or actually DG nerve or infinity nerve, whatever. So, a infinity nerve. So it goes from uh, the category, from this category into the category of simplicial set. Uh, and it generalizes the, the classical nerve. So it generalizes the classical nerve construction. And, and this category is wonderful. Uh, it has a model structure. I mean, it's basically just, it's basically like uh, the category of topological spaces. Uh, so, so you can do lots of things. You can glue and, and take homotopic limits and anything your heart desires. So, so first, uh, let me tell you about the classical nerve. I should say this is due to Lurie. Uh, Lurie plus, plus others. So, so the classical nerve. Uh, so if I have a category. Then N C uh, is a simplicial set. Where the the N simplices so the so the M, the N simplices are uh, N composable chains. Uh, no, n chains of composable morphisms. n chains of composable morphisms. So you have like, so I have like, uh, have uh, uh, n plus one objects. M plus one objects. Not necessarily distinct, of course, and and morphisms. One. So this would be so this would be like a three simplex. So this is like a three simplex. So here I have. Mm. Um, well, let me. Let's, let's do it like this. N plus one. So this is n, n simplex. So. Uh, Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so, so let, let me just expand on this a little bit more. I mean, you've, you've probably also heard something called uh, uh, classifying space. So classifying space. Space of C. So this is the, is the geometric realization
of this simplicial set. And so basically this way, the way this works is you have um, uh, you have a how does this work? Um, so you have, you have like a functor, let's say G, from the category of simplices of top. So you, t you take a you take an n simplex. Yeah. So you take an n simplex. So this is like the category. So this is like the the simp of x, uh, so the analog of simp of x that I was talking about. You have category simplices. So, um, um, so basically, you have simplices and morphisms between them are face maps and degeneracy maps. And so, uh, so you take an n simplex to the standard topological simplex. So standard topological simplex. And then you take, then you take the colimit over this uh, this category of G. So this is classifying space. So it's an actual topological space. So you can think of this as sort of uh, as the space of objects. Uh, in some stacky sense, so stacky meaning, well, stacky because some objects have symmetry groups and you want to kind of remember those symmetry groups in an appropriate way. So, so, so in that way, it, it's a classifying space. <clears throat> okay, so, so then Lurie's nerve So if I have an infinity category now, so I see the infinity category. So, so then I have N C. So, well, so objects are, so sorry, so zero simplices are uh, just objects. And one simplices uh, morphisms. Uh, so now for two simplices, th things get more interesting. So a two simplex um, with faces. So a two simplex sigma, say, uh, with with edges. M1, M2, M3. Um, so, so it's a morphism. It's a morphism. So I have. Okay, so I'm so going to do a two simplex. So I have like some objects C, uh, A, B, C. I have M1. M2, M3. So it will be a morphism in home AC uh, so that, so it's morphism, uh, say F, F in home AC, so that DF is M1 compose M2 minus M3. So, you know, so your two simplices are no longer just uh, compositions M1, M2. Rather, uh, so, so, so rather, you have, to, you have to specify this third edge, and then you have to specify uh, a morphism so that the difference uh, m1, m2 minus m3 uh, is the boundary of 
of this of this morphism which is specified so you keep so so already on on the level of uh, so for two simplices so this I forgot to say two a two simplex so for two simplexes you already kind of remember uh, uh, the structure of the chain complex. So the fact that morphisms have a chain complex structure. Okay, so since, since I'm running out of time, uh, let me skip three simplices because they're sort of more elaborate. Slightly more elaborate, not much more. Um, so, so basically, so for, for, for higher dimensional simplices, so you, you remember uh, not, just, not just the chain structure, uh, the chain complex structure on the, on the homes, on the home spaces, but also various A infinity associativity relations. Okay. So, um, Right, so, so this, uh, this NC, uh, this, is, this has some more structure, so it is not just, it's not just a simplicial set. It is, it is a, it is a quasi-category. or an infinity category. So it's just another, this is another way of saying infinity category. So let me just tell you what, what this is. If I have, if I have a simplicial set, um, so it's a simplicial set, then uh, and if I have a simplex, Then uh, I can look at the union. So I have like some. This is like the kth vertex. I can look at uh, the union of all faces, which are incident to the to the kth vertex. And that's called the kth horn. So this is the union. So the kth horn. Um, which is written like this. So it's the, the union of faces incident to the kth vertex. Okay, so, and then I'm gonna call this, uh, so this is just called a horn. This is called a horn. And the inner horn, um, it is called it is called inner. If um, if k is different, from zero or n. So, so then the definition uh, S is called a quasi category or infinity category if every so I, I can talk about. Uh, I can talk about such a horn in the absence of the actual uh, n simplex of which it is a horn of. So, so this definition says, says that you have an infinity category if every inner horn can be filled in a horn can be filled by an n simplex. Can be filled. 
you say. So, so that means that I can find an actual n simplex of which you are the horn. So, so this is a very simple conceptual definition compared, compared to, for example, an infinity category. Um, so morphisms of infinity categories are just simplicial sets. So again, morphisms are very transparent. Uh, so, um, right, so, right, so, so, so my nerve functor, so my nerve functor N is actually going to the category of infinity categories. So, um, okay, so then what you can do is, so instead of taking co-limit of the, the functor, the original functor FP, you can take co-limit uh, over simpex of N FP. So this is now in infinity category. Uh, and so, so you could think of this as being, uh, as being the, the Foucault category of the vibration. So it's no longer an infinity category, it's just, it is an infinity category. Let me say that again. It is no longer an A infinity category, it is just an infinity category. So, uh, but in fact you have more than that. So, so this is actually an invariant. So the point is that this, so let's call this, uh, let's call this Fook infinity of my vibration P, and this is an invariant. Fook infinity P is an invariant of P up to up to quasi equivalence up to quasi equivalence and and this is far from this is far from obvious I mean this uh, so there's nothing immediate about this. So the reason it works out this way is that there's actually yet another structure in the background. Um, so moreover, there is a, a okay, I'm gonna say some words now, call Cartesian. Vibration. Uh, and this is also invariant up to equivalence. So invariantly, invariantly assigned up to equivalence. So, so, so this, this structure sort of necessi necessitates kind of uh, using some uh, extra information from some extra ge geometric information that's, that's uh, hidden in this functor FP. And it is using this that you actually prove this. So, so this is the more fundamental, this is the more fundamental object. Uh, and then from this, we can extract a con vibration. Ah, oh, it's another thing I should say. A con vibration. Um, so which is basically, so, so basically just a it's a ref vibration, surf vibration. 
And then you can just do topology to you can just do topology to calculate invariance of your of your Hamiltonian vibration. And yeah, so Kant vibration. So let me just uh, 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 yeah, let me just add this here. So definition S is called a Kant complex. complex if every horn can be filled. And then, so, so a Kahn vibration is basically, if I, have a, if I have a horn in the base, like this, um, and I have a lifting of the horn upstairs, and if I have a feeling of the horn downstairs, then there is a lift, there is a feeling upstairs. So it's basically like a simplicial analog of a separation. Okay, so, okay, so the point is that, so going through the whole sort of story from a Hamiltonian vibration, I can get a topological vibration, which is, <laughs> And then I can I can just do topology, but it's not just topological vibration; it's a topological vibration with explicit simplices. So, uh, so explicit. So there's explicit, and I mean there are very few simplices. So you can actually kind of calculate um, various things about it by hand because you have so few simplices. Yeah. Uh, 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 right. So, I mean, so, for, so, so one of the one of the simplest examples where you you can make a calculation is if you have. Uh, so, if you look at S three to, so I guess this is, this is now the question. This is now the the, the question part of the, the talk. So, so uh, right. So, so I, I look at this natural generator. Uh, sorry, yeah, so generator of pi 3. So, so then I can get a vibration of S4. So, so this is, I get a vibration over S4 just by using this as a clutching map. So, so then you can actually show that this um, associated Kant vibration is non-trivial. And the way you do this, uh, so the way you show it's non-trivial, So, so basically, because my vibration was obtained as kind of by clutching map, so I have like something trivial here, something trivial here, and then uh, if I take a const, so I take a constant section, then uh, so the, so my gluing map is going to induce a gluing map of of uh, these conf of the conf vibrations. Let me just say vibrations. So it's going to induce a gluing map of vibrations. Uh, so, so this constant section here, so it's going to go to some to some section here. And since this is trivial, it's going to give an element in. It's going to give an element in pi three. So I get an element. So get an element in pi three. Well, I mean, it's in pi three of of the space. Say, so let's, let's call it p plus. But then, this is uh, because you can trivialize this. It's like in, so it's basically an element in pi three of the nerve. Um, the nerve of Fook S2. So you get an element here, and then you can show that this this element is non-trivial. So once you know that uh, this element is non-trivial, you deduce that your your vibration is non-trivial.
true. True. Topologically, I mean, yeah, topologically it's non-trivial, but uh, I don't know if my vibration, my, so, but I get, so I have some, some associated vibration here. I mean, a priori it might be trivial, right? Uh, true, well, in this case, you don't get any, I mean, so, I mean, first of all, we, we completely understand the space anyway, because this, this is just SO3. So, so there is no, there's nothing to be gained from a topology point of view. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, we understand this group. I must too, we understand it's SO3. So, but on the other hand, uh, this calculation, the calculation of, uh, I mean, showing that this is non-trivial uh, uh, gives uh, other information, for example, about the Hofer geometry of, uh, Give some information about the Hofer geometry of the space of Lagrangian equators in S2. So, so there's other symplectic information that you can get. Yeah. Other questions?